Hi, good evening to you all. Uh, my name is Dr. James Lanny, and I'm here to present a terrific webinar for you, and I hope you find it terrific. And it's the trials and tribulations of dissertations of theses, and boy, do we have those sometimes, and a methodology and results chapter game changer. So I hope you find this of interest, and, uh, and I hope you find it empowering, and um, let's get started. So um, first I should... Uh, First of all, I'll go over the agenda for the day. And uh, first, we're going to talk about, uh, I'm going to break it up into three acts. Really, that we're all kind of in the soup. We've all been at this stage or going into the stage of a dissertation or thesis. And what's at stake for all of us? You know, what's really going on? Um, two, act two, we're going to talk about some of the lessons learned and um, building alliances, confrontations at school. And then we'll talk about some roadblocks and workarounds for those. And in the third act, we're going to get into the meat of it, which is really, particularly for quantitative dissertations of theses, what do we do? The, what is the old way of creating data plans and sample size justifications and results chapters? And I want to show you a brand new way of accomplishing these tests with much less time and, and, and much less money. So, and then we'll conclude. We'll do some questions and answers and kind of wrap it up. And I hope to uh, be done within the hour. So just kind of see how it goes. Act one. Well, before we get, begin, I should just say, um, you know, I'm, it's a privilege to be able to speak to all of you out there. There are several hundred of you uh, listening to this. And I know that, um, you know, it's been a tough road and you've made it thus far. So uh, I just really want to honor that and uh, say it's a privilege to present some of this information to you. So we're all in the soup. So I I hope everyone has seen the Shawshank Redemption. If you haven't, it's a terrific movie. And it's basically a movie that talks about a guy in his ordinary life who gets pitched into a situation, into prison, meets a friend named Red who gives him tools, and he gets his way out. Now, I'm not quite analogizing dissertations and theses to prison, although it may feel like it sometimes. And I'm not quite analogizing the IRB or your dissertation committee to a prison warden either, because many of them are very, very helpful and uh, can be great, great, great supporters. Um, but there does seem to be a trajectory of moving from this old life, pitch into a new life, and then back to this old life and um, with new learnings. So. Um, Anyway, so I, I kind of put in some of the Shawshank Redemption throughout this presentation to kind of show that trajectory. And um, as I say in the bottom here, dissertations and theses are just not research projects. They are ordeals. And um, it's brand new. We'll never have to do it again. But here we are, right? Um, this picture is uh, of Andy who just realizes that he's in the soup and he's in prison and uh, does not quite have a plan just yet. But uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. So what's at stake? I mean, certainly, um, you know, we went into this thing with a dream, right? So we all came in, and, and I've been through my own dissertation, my own doctorate program. And, you know, we come in, and we, we want to do this. I mean, they would have had to have killed me before I not got in and finished. So, I mean, we're committed. And people are committed with their time and with their energy and with their money. And their families are also participating in this process. And their friends are participating in this process. Um, so th there's a lot at stake here. Um, certainly there's a security aspect. You know, some people need to uh, complete their doctorate for their, for their position, for their jobs, or job promotion. And they can move into other jobs as well. So there's a lot of opportunity surrounding it. And, uh, and often a lot of anxiety, too. Because anxiety and not feeling resourceful comes from meeting demands that we're not quite sure how to deal with. So um, um, I'm certainly during my own dissertation process, you know, homicidal, suicidal ideation and wanting to just stick my head in an oven, you know, occurred to me, right? So, um, so we've all been working through this, and, uh, but you are here or you're getting into it. Let me just scroll the correct way on the uh, mouse here. All right. So um, I guess we'll first start with just to kind of get some of your questions and comments. 
Um, and then I'll kind of talk about my own process a little bit, uh, take a step back. So my bachelor's degree was in electrical engineering, went in and got went to a master's degree in um, psychology, uh, research psychology, had to do a thesis there, then got into a clinical PhD program where I really did want to learn about research, but I was kind of math savvy and, um, and spent two years on my own dissertation. And a lot of it was the advisor that I picked. Um, but the truth is it could have been a heck of a lot shorter. And when I got out from that, I mean, I formed a company that was dedicated to assisting graduate students expedite their graduation. So we've been working for 10 years solid in developing tools, resources, software applications, lots of things to move you forward out of a state of, gosh, how the heck am I going to get out of this to, hey, I can use these tools and move forward. So I really want to tell you that we worked really hard at doing all of this. And um, anyway, I hope it's useful. Um, okay, so to ask questions, um, you can uh, type in the box to the right of the screen, and uh, you'll see a little red arrow uh, to enlarge the box. So that should kind of get you going. We did have a few questions that came in, you know, earlier on. And, um, you know, one was, you know, I feel stuck and, and I need motivation and tips, you know, how to get keep going. I defer to kind of the basic rules that we're firstly responsible for what we do and how we proceed. At the end of the day, it's not about advisors, it's not about our families, it's about us, and we're responsible to complete this process. It's our job to take that responsibility. Secondly, I mean, we have to see the end. You have to keep the end in mind. If you don't have the end in mind, you don't lose direction and focus. So you have to keep that end in mind. That is, you walking and you finally graduating after four, five, six, seven years, $30,000, $70,000. So you have to keep the end of you walking through and visualize that and see that. And then take minor steps. Every day, you have to take some step. Um, we have a newsletter uh, monthly that kind of hopefully speaks to some of these motivation issues. Um, so, But the, the point is, is that we're responsible, and I know you can do it. There's a lot of PhDs out there, and you can be one of those too. Um, Okay, so um, so one question comes in, uh, you know, is it realistic? What's a realistic time frame for a quantitative study? I got to tell you, um, it really depends. I mean, certainly if you're using secondary data, things are going to go smoother with the RIB process, for sure. Um, that you don't have to spend a month or two doing data collection. So there's a, so what I find, I mean, I think if you use some of the tools and stay focused. I think you could do a quantitative study in a year. I think that's realistic. Um, and that's focused because you have IRB is going to sit on your application for a month or two months, possibly kick it back. Advisors typically respond every two weeks. Some people have great relationships with advisors. Terrific. They can call them on the phone. They get a quick response in an email. Awesome. But I think realistically for most people, it's, I think a year is a time frame that should be kind of um, thought about. And we have other questions coming in at the moment. Um, should the chapters be pursued sequentially? Uh, I'm going to get to that in a little bit. Um, the quick answer is the methodology chapter should absolutely be the first thing. And uh, I'll, I'll talk about the reasons why that should be, but for sure, um, Chapter three first. Even if they only want chapter one and two, and they won't even look at three, that's fine. You and your own head and heart need to have chapter three down. And, and I'll get to that shortly. Um, someone says, overwhelmed with edits um, and how to get going. The only way I know how to help with edits is this. And uh, it came from when I was helping with a journal. And I uh, was not part of the peer review process, but I was in the administration part of it. The authors that got their journals through, they submitted their journal, submitted their article, rather, to the journal. They then, um, you know, got feedback from the peer reviewers. The way that they got it through was they addressed every single comment, every single comment that the, uh, that the peer reviewers had. 
And they did it in two places. They put it in the actual document, made those changes, and they put it in a letter to them and said, ah, I took, I took your comment seriously. So I've addressed this comment in this fashion, and it's on page seven. And then when they get to page seven, okay, that, that comment is addressed. So you have to take the comment seriously. People are not going to forget about their comments, okay? So you need to take them seriously and, uh, and address them in, in both those fashions. Um, <laughs> so one comment is, I can't, can't get around uh, my committee's egos. That goes back to the first part, which is we're responsible for creating those committees. Um, often t the, and I've seen literally, I've seen, I've worked with 2,000 dissertations. I've seen 5,000 of them. Um, the truth is, is, um, you know, you pick these guys. If you change, my point I was going to make was, if you change committee members, it often makes the process longer. And you get possibly noted as a problem student. So those are, I mean, unless the person is really, you know, really does not um, want to assist you or really doesn't see you finishing or doesn't agree with your study um, or is unresponsive, I mean, unless it's some, like, really dramatic things, I would say stick with the egos. Hell, if you know that they have egos, stroke their egos. Awesome comment, Dr. X, you know, give it back to them. So. Um, everybody's got egos, and some have larger ones, especially in positions of power. Um, so you have to deal with that. So, um, but but it doesn't make it easy, and I don't uh, admire that situation. For those who have not picked committees, listen to that question though. Watch out for those people. Talk. So I should make a comment about that. For students who have not picked committees yet, talk to other students. Right. How was it working with that chairperson, with that committee? How responsive were they? Did they seem interested? So um, choose well. And, um, you know, again, I mean, it's tougher to change them than not. Um, okay. Um, where do I find resources to fill learning gaps two years since last statistics class? Well, we have a 500-page website that has numerous resources. For example, um, we have a whole several hundred pages on different survey instruments, for example. That's one part of it. We have lots of tutorials. We have a, um, different types of membership that you can buy different tutorials. You can look at data plans, and we'll get to some of that as well. Um, first thing I should know about doing a dissertation, <laughs> it's a journey. It's a journey. It's the, it's not a um, cramming metaphor, it's a um, farming metaphor. So farmers don't um, just, um, you know, slack off all spring, and then at the end of the summer, you know, cram, 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 and try to, it's ridiculous, right? So you have to think about really doing it in stages, and think about it as a, really as a process, and plan for that. So farming metaphors, no, no, no uh, test cramming metaphors uh, anymore. Uh, and I, I guess that's the last question. Well, there's a few more questions here. Um, what if the committee doesn't understand the study? That could be good and that could be bad. I mean, um, it, I, I would say for the most part it's going to be bad because you're not going to get any assistance with that. Um, there are some committee members that are not confident around some areas. Um, I think that may be a case of of one in the of one in the switch. I mean, if they don't understand the study, I don't know what aspects they don't understand. Um, it's not particularly your job to really educate them around that. I mean, they're your advisors and they have the magic pens. So um, I don't know. I mean, I be curious to see if they don't if they don't understand the entire thing or what aspects of it they really don't understand. Um, and then I guess the final question for the moment, you know, how do I pick the right chairperson? Talk to other students. Who else have you worked with? And really, you know, you know if people are in your, in your court. So, you know, that's the chair you want. They can be tough, but they need to be fair. And um, so talk to other students. Um, ask them how long it took them. Ask them about the feedback and so forth. So, okay. 
I'm going to uh, move on to Act 2. Uh, great questions. And I'm going to try to answer a lot of these other questions. I mean, literally, we have hundreds of questions coming through. We'll, we'll look to answer them in an FAQ sheet, um, you know, on our website. Um, so we'll, we'll get that to you. Because the questions that you're asking, there's 40 other students that have the same kind of questions. Okay. Okay. So um, I want to talk about a few of the top lessons learned after a decade of this. Um, starting with the methodology chapter. And this really ties to if the study is doable, too, actually. So we all know there's an introduction, a literature review, methodology, results chapter discussion section, right? And the way the school system seemed to be working is, and let me just say, for, for true research, we had a research program going on, yes, investigate the literature, see what the holes in the literature are, see where they said future research can be conducted. Fine. For dissertations, though, I want to disagree. I think it's a different animal. And the different animal is this. We often know the questions we want to ask. Okay? We know the questions we want to ask. We often know the population we want to ask it to. And we often have read articles or um, know what kind of instruments can kind of assess those, uh, those measures. So if you start with the method, particularly the research questions, who are the participants, and what are the instruments, and a procedure to administer those instruments to those participants, that shows whether it's a doable study. If any of those things are off, you probably don't have a study. you got great instruments. You can administer the instruments, but you have nobody to administer them to. This makes no sense. You have participants. You can get to those participants, but you have nothing to administer to them, obviously. So you need to have all of those pieces. Once you have those methodology pieces, okay, two things occur. One, you at least know you have a doable study, okay? Secondly, now it doesn't speak to the rationale and so forth and the purpose. You have to justify all that, but at least you know you have a study that is doable. But it does two other things. It first says it now lets you focus your literature review. So if you're looking at self-efficacy by gender, for example, right? Now you can focus your literature around the self-efficacy literature, around gender differences, and you're not so far afield and it's all over the place. So it can really help you focus that literature review. Secondly, in the methodology uh, chapter, you're going to have a data analysis plan, and we're going to talk about that in a moment. That data plan is going to foreshadow the entire results chapter. That is, what am I going to examine and how am I going to examine it? So so the methodology is key, 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 key. And um, anyway, I think it's some of the best advice I got early, earlier on in my master's degree, and uh, I think it served me well and served many other students. And you have focus in the direction, too. Um, so I want to talk about building alliances. Um, critical. So in the um, in Shawshank Redemption, Certainly, Andy met Red, okay, who was able to befriend him and give him the tools to help him move forward. You need that, too. You may have a spouse. You may have a partner. You may have family members. You may have burned them out, too. <laughs> but importantly, you need other people and other colleagues and hopefully a great advisor or a committee member. You need people in your court to say, hey, you know what? Not always a pat in the back, but you're in the right direction. Keep going. You'll finish this thing. You need that energy. And we don't, you know, our energies can wax and wane over the, over the time that we're doing this. So it's really important to, to find those alliances. And, uh, and I hope that you've all found them. And, uh, and if not, find them. We're here, again, we have newsletters. Um, so we, we have diff lots of different types of support. But get those alliances in. Um, they're, they're critical. In any endeavor and in any journey, there's going to be confrontations. Uh, in the Shawshank Redemption, the confrontation came when Andy locked himself in the, um, in the office and played the opera music. Um, we don't have to be as oppositional during that confrontation, but certainly going through the rubrics and the dissertation classes and the statistics classes, 
and the IRB process. I mean, it could be unrelenting at times and back and forth. And you're like, I mean, seriously, you want to stick your head in an oven to say, when do they stop with this? Um, you know, it's a very different process from what it was, I'll go back historically, 30 years ago. 30 years ago, the IRB was purely to make sure that those participants were safe. That was it, okay? We wanted to ensure their safety, which is a completely reasonable review process. It's not that way anymore, okay? And I'm very familiar with all of Capella's and Nova's and um, many of the online schools and a lot of the, the brick and mortars as well. All of their rubrics and their IRB and their SMR forms, and they're just not looking for um, safety of those participants. They're looking for, is your study doable? So you're responding to people you may never even have met before. So um, it's a, it's, it's a um, what I want to say, it's a process where it's another actual, like a reader, okay, who are also gatekeepers. And it can also have a confrontation with your time and your resources. I mean, going on, and I've heard stories about IRBs where they're not getting back for weeks and weeks and weeks. And the student's pain and the student's stress. And the student is often working and have a family and supposedly have an individual exercise time and things of this sort. So, um, you know, confrontations do occur. And, um, you know, we have to keep moving through that for, for sure. I'm going to keep flipping on here. <clears throat> so, uh, as I said in the beginning, um, not all uh, dissertation advisors or thesis advisors are wardens, uh, but some of them are, and some of them make it really tough. Um, and so, all I could say is that, you know, that there are roadblocks. Our job in taking responsibility for our success is to move through those. Get the support that you need, the support you need. In the movie, um, you know, uh, Red gives Andy a rock hammer uh, as a tool, which helps him escape and dig a hole out of there. Um, reach out, get those tools, get the support that you need. Um, there are ways to uh, work around it. And, um, and we have lots of templates, and we're going to show you some terrific stuff uh, shortly to kind of show you some of these tools. So. Um, questions and comments around roadblocks and, and uh, things of this sort um, or alliances that you've uh, made. Uh, we already have some questions coming in. Uh, are suggestions applicable to EDDs too? Absolutely. This goes, this applies to any research process, particularly master's students doing theses, PhDs, PsyDs, EDDs. In, in a broad, across most fields. So absolutely, everything I'm saying speaks to that research process for sure. Um, how long should chapter four and five take? Well, I'll tell you what my experience is. So my experience is, is that people without assistance, I see them, they come back to me a year later. I said, what have you been doing for the past year? Okay, so it's gonna take as long as it takes until you get either the knowledge or the support to move you forward. Critical, get the tools you need. Your job to get out. It's your responsibility and it affects your work and, your, and everything. So you, you need to um, get moving with it. We, we, I'm gonna show you something about chapter four that's gonna, I mean really, it's not out there in the world yet and it will really blow you away when you see what we can do with chapter four. Um, when we consult, we're typically two to three weeks out. And we do have one-to-one -one consulting, you know, uh, more customized hand-holding. And um, so we typically turn around two to three weeks. And um, um, no matter whether it's descriptive or it's more sophisticated structural equation modeling or time series and things of that sort. So the whole range of things, a few weeks um, to get it back to you. And then uh, any feedback that the committee may have. Um, could I use incentives to uh, get back surveys? Absolutely. Bribe, beg, whatever it takes. You cannot complete what you're doing without those participants. You must, you must share with them. Email them again and just say, look, I'm just trying to get finished. 
would you please help me fill out, fill out the survey? So yeah, I mean, I've seen things that, you know, will put you in for a raffle for an iPad. Um, there's lots of ways to incentivize that. Um, but I'm not afraid of using guilt, money, whatever it takes to say, I need your help, you know, because if, unless you get those participants, chapter four is not getting done, chapter five's not getting done, and you're not going to walk, and you're going to wind up paying more tuition anyway. Think about the value. Um, do you have a list of reviewers, proofers for dissertations? Um, I mean, we can review your dissertation. I mean, really, our, focus, our particular focus is really we're methodologists, statisticians, and we do qualitative analysis as well. Um, we do have APA editors that can really read through it and make sure this kind of flows and so forth. Um, how do I choose my study? And then I'll, I'll do, uh, do a few more questions. Um, how do I choose my study? Well, in my case, I went in with my study, and my dissertation advisor said, Jim, very nice, you're going to do my study, because he had a research program, and I just did what he did. So sometimes you're just pitched into it, kind of like being drafted, I guess. Um, you know, you're in. Um, I mean, it should be something that, that you're interested in. I mean, you have to, not overly interested, but interested enough to keep you going for however long it's going to take. Um, you know, just think about what you want to study. You know, write down, a, you know, get some, you know, nine by five index cards, write down the different options, generate some ideas, brainstorm, start narrowing it down, see the commonalities between them, and see what you can do to, uh, uh, to pick a topic. But don't spend six months doing it, okay? Pick a darn topic and go for it. Um, what is, uh, how do I ensure a study is doable? Um, well, as I said, uh, the methodology. A study is doable if you have a solid method. I should say, too, just a point about uh, writing methodologies. That methodology, um, it's, it's the idea is that it's replicable. So if your next-door neighbor who knows nothing about your study looks at your methodology chapter, should be able to replicate that study, right? They say, here, here are the questions I want to examine in the study. Here are the participants I'm going to assess. Here are the instruments that I'm going to administer to them. And here's the procedure that I'm going to administer that to them. So they, they should be able to replicate it. So um, a study is doable to the extent that that methodology is clean and understandable, right? Okay. All right, I'm going to go on. So, um, so in Act 3, this is this is the rock hammer of this is the rock hammer tools okay this is how to move you through the methodology and the results chapter quickly very quickly and at least give you a template and something to work with you can use what we're going to show you as either a template that you can edit you can use it to validate what you currently have so Again, it's a tool. It's not the total answer, but it's a great, great, great tool. It's going to save you a hell of a lot of time and money. So I want to go on to uh, – now, we're going to go live, okay? And uh, – oh, I'm sorry. We're going, to, we're going to go through some of the old ways of doing it, and I'm not going to spend too, too long on it, but give you a flavor of what people typically do, and I'm going to show you a new way of how it can be done, all right? So here's the old way of doing a – um, a data analysis plan. The old way of doing a sample size justification or power analysis and the old way of doing a results chapter. And as I said, I'm going to blow you away in about five minutes about this new results chapter. So, okay, let me, so the old ways. All right, so the old ways are, let's just imagine you have phrased your research question appropriately. You decide for sure you want to do a multiple regression. But as someone asked that question earlier, I haven't taken a stats class in a year, two years, three years. How do we know what to write up about multiple regression? How do I know the assumptions to put in or to leave out? Things of this sort. How do I know the sample size for that? So you would have to look up, and how do I justify that that's the appropriate analysis? Well, let me back up. Data analysis plans have three parts, to be sure. What analysis are you going to do? What are the assumptions of those analyses? And what is a justification 
why is that the appropriate analysis? By the way, if you miss any of this, we will, we will tape this and we'll be and we'll be on the website. But so don't worry about writing things down. Just you know, focus in and and, and follow along the best you can. And, and and you can come back to this. So the old way is you know look up a justification. You know you have to Google it or go back to your textbook. Okay, you have to read through different websites to say, okay, gosh, what are the assumptions? What the heck do they mean? Because you have to understand what the assumptions are. Because during that proposal defense, they're going to say, what do you mean by homoscedacity? You need to have an answer. You have that word in there, okay, which is one of the assumptions of regression. You're going to have to uh, tell them what that is, or at least be prepared to say that, okay? So writing that data plan, you have a lot of web searches. You have to read through it and figure out you know, how do I now frame that in my methodology chapter? More websites, reading about multiple regressions, how do I write the equations? And then really, you know, how is it structured? What else should be in it? Um, okay, so you really, and you have to do this, by the way. I've seen a lot of data analysis plans where they're just, um, they write, well, I'm going to do an ANOVA multiple regression. That's not sufficient. You have to, for each particular research hypothesis, you need a particular strategy or data analytic plan to examine that hypothesis. So for every single research question or hypothesis, you need a specific statistical analysis. Okay. All right. <clears throat> sample size. Um, so the old way of do, well, let me just say a word about sample size. And I don't know why there's so much confusion out there in the world about this, frankly, but there's two type of sample sizes in the world, okay? One sample size is based on the population. So if I want to study kindergarten teachers, I can say, well, how many kindergarten teachers are in the U.S.? And what sample, how many should I pull out of that population for an adequate sample size? That is never never ever the case in dissertations and theses. We, unless you're an NIH multi-million dollar funded researcher, that's not the case. You're not going to be able to systematically sample out of the whole country, okay? We often just have uh, convenient samples, snowball samples. So it's never about the population, okay? What it is always about is it's a power analysis or sample size justification. And it goes like this. Your research question or hypothesis is stated in statistical language. Okay? That statistical language in that research question then drives your data analysis plan. What kind of statistics are we going to use? Okay? Chi-squares, parametric, non-parametric. Okay? From, um, from the statistics that you choose, now that drives the sample size. It's the analysis, not the population. Always, 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 always. Okay? So, and some people have experience working through the power analysis, and, um, but some people have zero experience with this at all. But the way to do it the old-fashioned way is to download G-Power. Uh, it's, it's, I don't know if it's German, but uh, it's actually in English once you get it downloaded, okay? After you get that, you have to pick out your analysis. You then have to uh, look to see, you know, what parameters you want on there, okay? And what numbers you edit, which ones don't you? And then ultimately you get your sample size number, okay? And you have to cite it. So now you have to take what you learned from G-Power, okay? And the sample size and put it in some phraseology that makes sense, okay? That says basically, you know, with a power of 0.80, and alpha 0.05, okay? Here's the sample size with some effect size, okay? All right. The third old thing I want to share with you, and particularly for those that are in the results chapter, are going into the results chapter, or have the farming mentality that haven't started but said, ah, you know what? Let me plan ahead, okay? Here's the old way of doing it. The old way of doing it is you upload your data to SPSS. Okay. Then you conduct descriptive statistics, all right? So that is means and standard deviations, frequency, and percentages. Okay, 
Then you get tables, okay, that show you the percentages, okay? And then you have to move that over, export it, move it over to a, or print it out, move it over to a Word document, format that document in APA 6 edition, okay? Tables. All right. Then you have to conduct the analysis, right? So let's just say we want to conduct a linear regression, okay? You have to deal with any uh, issues coming up from SPSS. So if the, if the labels in the variable view were not set up appropriately, you're going to have to figure out what the heck do I do with that, okay? And that happens, okay? So an example of, you know, Googling around to figure out, you know, uh, what to do. Okay, then you have to figure out the assumptions of those analyses. Some of it you'll get from the data plan, but you still have to know how to use SPSS to figure out where do I click for multicollinearity and so forth. I want the beta coefficient. So you have to know what to click, what not to click in there. Okay. This is the old way of doing it. Okay. When you look at assumptions, you have to know what kind of plots to request. Okay. Then you have output, okay? Not APA output. Some of these statistics are important for your results chapter. Some are not, okay? So figure out which ones are which. When you do that, you need to then pull that into, well, just to see what kind of table or regression table is asking for, okay? Then you're going to have to pull it into a Word document, and, and, and then you're going to have to interpret the relevant statistics and create a table that is APA formatted. Okay. So now I'm going to turn it over to a live version, which shows you a new way, okay, the game-changing way, particularly for you farmers, okay, of how to conduct a sample size, a data analysis plan, and a results chapter, okay? So I'm going to turn it over to my partner. So. Um, for the sample size, and by the way, this sample size, before we can get moving forward, this sample size, everyone who's attending right now, okay, now listen to the video later, everyone who's attending right now is going, is getting the basic membership, okay? The basic membership has the sample size justification in there. So you're done with G-Power for the rest of your God-given life. And by the way, once you finish, you're never going to see this thing again either, okay? So... Everyone who's watching this at this moment gets this membership. So, and so these are sample sizes. So what we've done, and if we can scroll down just to open up all of the different uh, types we have there. So we have taken the time to look at all of the common statistics that I've looked at in the past decade. And you can see the ANCOVAs, the ANOVAs, T-tests, regressions, MANCOVAs. All of these, we've looked at each one of these tests and the different parameters, okay? For example, you know, how many uh, predictors there are or how many groups there are. And we have written up, you know, hundreds and hundreds of uh, sample size templates, okay? So each person, so for each analysis, uh, you can see what the sample size is. Okay, so let's just imagine we're looking for doing a multiple regression and uh, linear, multiple regression or multiple linear regression. All right, so you click on that. You'd have to pick how many different predictors you have. And let's just imagine you have three predictors. In three seconds, you have a template of, for a small, medium, and large effect size, at least a narrative that you can start working on, okay? or at least match up with your existing sample size justification. And something to work on, it says, hey, this is how many participants I need. Here's the power. Here's the alpha. It's cited. This is the way to do it. And again, we have it for all of those different tests that you can see on the left-hand part of the screen. And uh, this will definitely move your sample size forward. And, and uh, when I started out, you know, 15 years ago, you know, I struggled with this for quite a while. So to have this tool which is in your hands right now, uh, terrific way to get started, terrific way to get started. So um, now we'll go on to data plans, okay? So the, uh, the data plans are not included in the basic membership. You can upgrade for 90 bucks 
and come up with a data plan for each of these different analyses. So let's imagine we want a data plan for multiple linear regression or linear regression. And we'll just click on, uh, there you go. So, and when you click on that, in one second, you have a template. And I'm going to stay right there at the research questions. You can see how the research questions should be phrased, okay? So, as I said before, your research questions and hypotheses need to be stated in statistical language. That is, if you are talking about differences, you're kind of in ANOVA land or t-test land. If you're talking about prediction, then we're talking about regressions and so forth. So, we just picked multiple regression. You can see that we've laid out a template for the research questions and hypotheses. Basic language, but everybody gets it, and the committee gets it, and the RRB gets it. So you want it simple, clear, and in that language. We then talk about, under the data analysis plan, even places where you can just put in your variables, okay? And we talk about, well, we're going to use these three predictors to predict this outcome variable. We talk about the assumptions of the analysis, okay? And then we have references. So in two seconds, you have a template to work on, okay? The, uh, by the way, with our different memberships, you do have a, um, a statistical analysis tool that helps you select the analysis you should be using, okay? Which is really based on the different levels of measurement of the data, okay? Now, based on the research question and how that data is going to be coded, that's going to drive the type of analysis you can do, okay? Um, so, okay, so, and we have this for, for, again, for most of the, if we could scroll up just a little bit, you know, we have them for most of the um, uh, statistics, uh, statistical analysis that I've seen over the past decade. Again, it's not going to cover time series, not going to cover confirmatory factor analysis or things of this sort, but for 99% of you watching this at the moment, this is going to move you forward in, in, in seconds, okay? All right. So now I'd like to move to the um, to the main. Well, those are pretty main too. But I want to move to. And we just say that for a second. So I want to move to a results chapter tool, brand new. Okay, never before. This tool is basically going to take your data. We'll walk through it, and I'll show you what it can do. But basically, it's taking your data and creating a results chapter draft for you in APA format with dynamic logic that shows you how to interpret it. So you can at least validate what you have or say, hey, here's a great starting point, okay? So first thing we're gonna do, it's very, very simple, okay? First, you're gonna browse and upload your data set, okay? All right, straightforward, and you click upload, all right? And sometimes you get logged out, but there we are. Okay, I think we need to upload the data. It says not uploaded. Uh, it's uploaded. Terrific. Okay, great. So the next step is it shows you the variables that are uploaded to your data, uploaded to the application, and it shows you the level of measurement of that. Okay? You just simply click continue. Now, we get to pick uh, linear regression or multiple linear regression. Notice, by the way, if you just go back that for one quick second, that you, can, you can see all of the different tests. These are going to be available September the 30th. Okay, I'm going to give you an opportunity to pre-order it. But all of these tests are available, and th these are going to cover a majority of what you're doing. Okay, so, and I'll show you what it does. So let's just go ahead and pick linear regression. Terrific. Click continue. Then you have an opportunity to put in your dependent variable, okay, your outcome variable or criterion level variable. <clears throat> and then you're going to select the number of predictors that you have, okay. And uh, you can do that pretty easily. You can see that. Okay. By the way, we've kind of made a dummy proof where you can't select the same variable twice. You can't select variables that are not appropriate to that analysis, so it's kind of foolproof that you can't really make mistakes. So we've thought through um, how do we streamline this thing. Then you just simply conduct my analysis, okay? And in one, two seconds, you're going to have a results chapter draft. 
two seconds. We take two to three weeks. So the first thing I want to show you is that descriptives are run. Let me say that for just a second. The descriptives are run for all of your categorical level variables. It says, here's how many males and females we have. Here are their percentages and so forth for each one of these categorical level variables. Then, and we can scroll on down. Then we present a table in APA format that shows you all of the categorical level variables with their frequency and percentages. Okay? This is going to take you time to conduct this, move it over, format this thing, right? So this is done, two seconds. Continue on down. Then for all of your continuous level variables, you're going to have means and standard deviations and the ranges of those, okay? All right. So we lay that out in narrative form, and if you don't need the narrative form, you just delete it, no problem. You have a nice clean table of the means and standard deviations of that. Here's the time saver and the money saver and the tuition saver right here. The regression, it lays out and interprets the regression that you just selected. And you can do this for all the analyses that you want to do, okay? Um, so it says we conduct a linear regression, multiple linear regression. We have these several predictors. We have this outcome variable. We already uh, put into the application the types of assumptions that need to be assessed. And I'll show you those uh, graphs uh, down at the end of this. Then, importantly, it shows the results of the linear regression were significant. It lays out for you exactly how it's supposed to be phrased. Okay? Here's the, you know, here's the F value. Okay? It's significant. That is the model significant. It gives you the R square value. It then goes into each one of the predictors and talks about those beta coefficients and the T values and the probability of those and interprets all of those different values. The same is done whether we do an ANOVA or a chi-square or a correlation, all of it's dynamically interpreted, all in APA format. We scroll on down, it shows you two of the figures that are assessing the assumptions of a multiple linear regression. You can, if you had 10 hypotheses, okay, and you ran through 10 tests, in literally a few moments, you would have a results chapter draft. And I'm just not talking about the non-farmers, I'm talking about the farmers. Get a draft in front of you, something that you can edit, okay? All right. Um, should we do one more? Uh, let's just go ahead and do an ANOVA, okay? So uh, we just click on a one-way ANOVA. Click Continue. Okay. Uh, we're going to select. Now, it only lets you, by the way, it will only let you select an independent variable that's categorical because that's the only type of variable that an ANOVA can use, okay? Under the dependent variable, outcome variable, it only lets you see continuous level variables, okay? And click conduct my analysis, one, two seconds. Two seconds. Again, shows you the descriptives, thanks for lodging that, frequency and percentages, okay? The tables, okay? We're gonna scroll down. It shows you the uh, means and standard deviations, okay? with the table, okay? Then we get to the meat of it, okay? Terrific. So to examine the uh, research question, and now ANOVA was conducted to see if there's differences. It imputes the variables that you uh, identified, reading tests by ethnicity. It identifies the levels of ethnicity. It talks about the assumptions of the tests. Scroll on down. And how to get around it. And it conducts post hoc tests for you. So as you may well know, ANOVAs often can use post hoc tests or secondary analyses. It automatically conducts those. Then it puts the ANOVA in an APA formatted table, and it gives you the means and standard deviations, okay? Perfect draft, perfect draft, two seconds, literally two seconds, right? And then it shows you a, uh, a figure of the different means uh, of, a, of a reading test by ethnicity, okay, with the references. So, this is an example of how to really, really game change what's going on. These give you strong templates to use to, to move forward. Again, you can go back and say, what are the assumptions of ANOVA? How do I do a post hoc test? How do I figure it out in SPSS? But this gets you going and moves you through it, okay?
Okay, I'd like to go uh, like to go forward. <coughs> How are we doing? Okay, so um, I want to go back to the PowerPoint if I can. And uh, so do we have, I, I guess we're going to go to question and answers, right? Okay, so um, so we'll conclude with some questions and answers, and then we'll kind of just wrap it up here. And again, if we don't get to your questions, um, for sure, uh, we'll try to get them on an FAQ. Um, are these my questions right here? Okay. Um, okay, so concept paper has been approved. What timeline should I expect to have chapters one and two completed? Again, it's very committee dependent and having things streamlined. Uh, under our basic membership, you do get a dissertation template, which you can use for your thesis as well. Okay, so the um, so you want to look at that template and you want to make sure that you have different aspects uh, within each chapter laid out. So each part. Each of the subheadings and uh, paragraphs in that chapter are important, so you're going to need to to uh, to address those. Um, the timeline is really you doing that uh, well and uh, following that template or rubric. Um, okay. Um, Methodology is repeating someone else's study, but uh, Tessa's had ten years of experience. Uh, I don't have experience. Is method still valid? It's really what the committee approves. I mean, really. Um, I mean, to the extent that you can follow someone else's methodology, great. Particularly around qualitative studies. Qualitative studies, no matter what, if you're studying self-efficacy or you're studying the, um, you know, the amount of oranges growing on trees, that, that um, well, you wouldn't quite be studying oranges on trees for qualitative, but um, <laughs> you you um, the, the same methodology, be it phenomenological or this through this open axial selective coding, you want to use that same uh, that same template. Okay. Um, I'm grabbing a few more questions. Um, okay. Uh, uh, we need to. Uh, okay. Can you customize for factor analysis? Yeah. I mean, we're look we're looking to have that. Great question. It will probably be for uh, EFAs first, exploratory factor analyses, then confirmatory. But yeah, we look to have factor analysis in there. Uh, when will the software be available? The software is available. It's going to be. I'm pre-selling it. Well, let me just get to the the, the pitch part of it, right? So the soft, the pre-sale of the software, it's available. We're going to be selling it for seven hundred ninety-five dollars. That's the price of the software. We, we charge many, many times that, okay, to do a results chapter. The software we're pre-selling, it's going to be available September the 30th for $495. $495. That's one-tenth of a tuition, a semester of tuition, and you saw the, the amount of time. Um, so for sure, um, and we're going to send you an email right after this, and we're going to actually, we'll walk you through how you can pre-purchase this, okay? Uh, 495 and we're actually, you know, I keep wanting to push stuff out. I have a CFO who doesn't want me to do this. But if you order or the next two hours, you're going to get 30 minutes of consulting free, 30 minutes of consulting free, okay, around any topic that you want, okay, but particularly around the software, okay. So you can have to make sure your data is uploaded well and that you can run it, $495. Um, 30 minutes free consult for the next two hours. And then if you buy it by Sunday, we'll keep the 495 um, figure, okay? After that, it's going to be $795, all right? Um, okay. Uh, so, okay. So, back to some of the questions. Does data need to be from SPSS? No. I mean, currently, we have it in, you can, up, you can have it in Excel, okay, a CSV file or a .sav file. Uh, we hope to be able to translate it from any data sets, but you know, those are the most common. If you have an Excel or SPSS, that's the vast majority of whom I'm speaking to. Um, and do I need to buy, so, and no, you, so you will not have to buy SPSS, okay? You can put your data into an Excel format. If the data is already in SPSS, terrific, but you don't have to go buy the program, okay? Um, for sure. Um, 
so uh, does this so does the software do what SPSS does, but adds the write up? That's precisely what it does. But it's also it's helping you out with the assumptions. It's helping you out with the interpretation, and it's helping you out with APA style. Excuse me. And again, within literally seconds. Um, and it may be much, much more as time goes on, but at the moment, $7.95, $4.95 for the next few hours and for a few days. Um, so, okay, and uh, let me see here. Uh, okay, so other things I need to mention here. Um, everyone has the, um, the free and the basic membership, okay, which has the, um, uh, which has the sample size uh, tool in it. The full access has the data plans. It's an extra 90 bucks. You can go online and buy it. Um, and we'll walk you through some of that. Should we be doing that now? Okay. So we'll walk through how you can upgrade your membership or how you can uh, get the pre-sell the, uh, pre the software. Okay. Pre-purchase pre the software, I should say. Um, okay. And... Um, my trusty assistant's going to uh, get back on our website, I think. So to, okay, so the first thing we want to do is just really to to pre-search, to pre-purchase the software, just go to uh, Statistics Solutions Pro Software and click on it. Uh, go to statisticsolutions.com for sure, okay, statisticsolutions.com, and we'll email you all this as well. And you just click on that button. Okay, and then um, it's a 30% discount. And just fill out the information, okay, and we'll know what if it comes in within the next two hours, and we'll uh, contact you regarding that 30-minute free consultation. And we'll know if you get it before Sunday as well, and we'll change it around. Uh, so just fill out your information, and then uh, put in your billing information, okay, and click order now, and then you're good to go, okay. All right, and then so uh, statisticsolutions.pro, I mean, maybe we can go back to that one screen. Okay, so back to the uh, home screen. So again, statisticsolutions.com, and then just click on the uh, the coming soon, Statistic Solutions Pro. It's gonna be available. The uh, 495 gets you 30 days of use. I should say it gets you 30 days of use. It starts September the 30th, but if you don't start your study until November, that's fine. So it's 30 days from your first use, which should be sufficient time for you to conduct all of your analyses and to get feedback and to modify that as well. So it's a it's a real game changer. Uh, do we want to show you how to upgrade? So and to upgrade the um, membership, um, it's fine. So you will we'll know once you log in, you'll already have the basic membership. And then you'll you'll have a button to upgrade it, and you can upgrade it to full access, where you can now get the uh, data analysis plans. Um, okay, so I want to conclude. Um, you know, we've all gotten to this point, okay? Or you, you're moving into it. Um, both farmers and people that needed the results done yesterday, okay? Um, our job, it's our responsibility to move through this, to stay motivated to get the tools we need, and to graduate. Our entire life is waiting for us again. People have gotten older, but our life is still waiting for us, and it's important. So there's a lot riding on it. Um, get the help you need, be it free resources, be it software, whatever it is. Get the help you need. I, uh, it's a, it's, you know, we've endeavored on a courageous act, and I really do really honor your process and sticking in there with it. Um, your old life is waiting for you, and uh, and I know that you'll do it. And I look forward to contacting you and hearing from you, and uh, um, you know keeping in contact for sure. Um, obviously, we have other consulting. You can send us questions anytime. We have one-on-one -on -one consulting. We have these tools. We have free resources, and uh, anything we can do to uh, to assist you. Uh, you know, my job when I started out was to um, help students get through. And uh, there's a quote by Rumi who said that once the seed of faith takes root, it cannot be blown away even by the strongest wind. When we go through those confrontations and we go through those winds, okay, know that you're still rooted and that you will finish this. Um, 
any questions at all, you can email uh, Melissa uh, at uh, uh, Melissa at statisticsolutions.com. And uh, I want to thank you all for attending. And I hope you really got something out of it. And I look forward to you uh, guys signing on for whatever you can sign on for. And uh, just wish you great success. And uh, thank you so much for attending.